I'm happy to share with you all this morning about land transport developments in Singapore, with particular focus on how we plan to deliver a people-centric land transport system in order to support the economic growth of Singapore and to help achieve a quality living environment for our citizens. Now, if you're not familiar with Singapore, we are located at the southern tip of the Malayan Peninsula. We're just a small city-state of about 700 square kilometres in land area with a population of 5.2 million. This is uh, based on the 2011 census and the GDP of US uh, 208 billion as of 2010. Now, with the limited land available in Singapore and a very high densely populated area, it is critical that we have a highly efficient land transport system to meet the needs of the economy. Now, the Land Transport Authority, or LTA in short, we are a stat board, a statutory board under the Ministry of Transport. And we are responsible for all land transport matters from planning to development, operations management to regulation. And we have two pu major public uh, transport operators, you'll be familiar, both SMRT and SBST. Now, land transport infrastructure currently takes up about 12% of our land area. Okay, in comparison, housing takes up about 15%. And for public transport ridership, we have seen significant ridership growth from 4.3 million average daily trips in 2002 to 6.6 .6 million as of February 2012. That's about a 50% increase over 10 years. Now, the increase in population has subjected the public transport systems to severe stress. And going, hence, going forward, there's a need for us to accelerate the growth of our public transport systems to cope with the, exist, with the increasing demand. Now, when the LTA was formed in 1996, a white paper was developed to guide land transport developments over the next 10 years. Now, there were four strategic trusts that were covered in the paper. This included ensuring that public transport is planned in tandem with overall land use plans, so as to achieve very good integration and viability of our public transport enhancements. Harnessing of technology was also advocated to maximise our road network capacity. And as for private transport users, demand measures to control vehicle growth and help manage road traffic congestions were also proposed. The white paper has done well and we have actually implemented most of the plans in the following 10 years after 1996. So in 2006, the LTA started a review of the white paper, and this culminated in the Land Transport Master Plan, we call LTMP in short, in 2008. And this envisioned a people-centric land transport system, and really there are three major strategic trusts, which is, first, making public transport a choice mode, secondly, managing road usage, and thirdly, to meet the diverse needs of the people. Now, amongst the many initiatives under the first strategic trust, LTA will be assuming the role of central bus planner in order to achieve better integration of our public transport systems through the formation of transportation nodes, promoting a hub and spoke model with the rapid transit system, or RTS in short, serving as the backbone. Another key initiative is a significant expansion of our RTS network. Okay, I've lumped mass rapid transit metros and light rapid transit together. We call it the RTS. A budget of 16 billion Sing dollars, approximately 30 billion pounds, has been committed towards this effort. To complement the RTS network, there will also be measures to improve bus operations and accord priority to buses on the roads in order to complement the RTS. Our electronic road pricing system was the first of its kind and scale to be introduced in 1997 and has proven enormously successful in managing road usage. Now, riding on advances in info communications, detection, payment and enforcement technologies, tests are currently underway for a more flexible ERP system which can be adapted to the different policy objectives to better manage traffic demand. Now, while supply-side measures Sorry, while demand-side measures are important, supply-side measures are equally important to complement the demand measures. And in an effort to control vehicle population, the growth rate has been lowered from 3% annually to 1.5% last year. 
and this will be further lowered to 0.5% by end of 2012. So it will not be a very welcoming uh, notice for all our private uh, vehicle owners. One of the most important attributes of a people-centric land transport or transport system is to be able to meet the diverse needs of users. I shall elaborate on this further in, in the later part of my presentation. Now, let me share with you some of the key 2020 goals in our LTMP, especially for public transport. We aim to increase the mode share of public transport during AM peak to 70% as compared to private transport by 2020. The current modal split is 59%, and taking into consideration the projected rise in population, we think this is going to be a very challenging target. We have also set ourselves a target of 85% of commuters completing their journeys within 60 minutes from door to door by 2020. So to attain these goals, much has to be done to increase the attractiveness and use of our mass public transport. The rapid transit system, or RTS, has been and will continue to be the backbone of our public transport system because of its sure higher carrying capacity, the speed and greater reliability. In 2020, we plan to double our RTS network to 278 kilometers with a density of about 51 kilometers per million passengers by then. Now, our passenger throughput with the RTS, the first line, compass line in 1996, was about 1 million trips per day. By 2011, we have achieved 2.4 million trips per day. And in the next few slides, I will share with you our RTS development plans and expansion plans. Okay, this is the map of Singapore. The outline here is we're just a small island south of Malaysia. From 1983 to 2003, we had constructed three main RTS lines linking the major industrial estates to the city in the southern, in the south, in a radial fashion. So this is the north-south line, and the east-west line, and the northeast line. And this is basically the city center area. So you can see it's fairly radial. Collectively, the North-South Line and the East-West Line are known as the Compass Line. And the Northeast Line, which is our first fully automated and driverless heavy metro line, 20 km long, was opened in 2003. In 1999, 2003 and 2005, we added LRT, or Light Rapid Transit System, to three towns which are not served by the MRT. So they were namely at Bukit Panjang, Sengkang and Pongo. Bukit Panjang, Sengkang and Pongo. Now, these LRT systems serve as feeders to our main MRT lines and help to alleviate the need for buses and have, therefore relieving the traffic congestion on our roads. We completed the Boon Lay extension in 2009 by adding two fully elevated stations in the west to serve the increasingly built up and populated area there. The Circle Line. Another fully automated driverless line is a very strategic line link, built to link up all the existing lines. And it serves areas not covered by the existing lines as well. So it links up all the lines as well as serving some of these areas. The entire project started in 2000 and was completed in 2011. It has a route length of 33 kilometers, fully, um, fully underground with 29 stations. Earlier this year, we had introduced an extension to the circle line to serve the new downtown and financial center, and one of which, which provides a direct access to the new Marina Bay Integrated Resort, which incidentally has one of the casinos there. A southern extension to the north-south line is currently under construction. This line will be completed in 2014 with a new station built to serve the new international cruise terminal that will be opened in a few months' time. To the west, a new western extension called Tuas West Extension will be added to the east-west line, comprising four fully elevated stations over 7.5 kilometers and a, and a new depot, which will be the biggest depot in Singapore. Currently also in various stages of design and construction, is a 242 kilometers downtown line, fully, fully underground. It comprises three phases, 34 stations, and will link the northwest and the eastern regions to the new downtown in the south. Okay, the line will be completed uh, in phases in 2013, 2015, and 2017. 
A new line will be planned, uh, a new line is being planned to relieve the heaviest load currently experienced on the north-south line. So this is a new line we're planning. This is currently in the design stage, it's called the Thompson line, and it's targeted for completion around 2018 with approximately 23 stations over 30 kilometers. And then scheduled to be completed in 2020 is the, what we call the Eastern Region Line, 12, kilometers over 20, uh, 12 stations over 21 kilometers, which will help to serve the growing developments planned in the Eastern area. So with all the lines in place by 2020, the city centre, as you'll see, is a crowded mess now, will have a train station within every 40, 400 metres on average, roughly equating to about a five-minute walk. So clearly, we are in a very busy and exciting period of Singapore's public transport history, with a new line or extension opening every year from now to 2020. Now, while expanding the reach and coverage of our RTS network, we have also actively looked at ways to optimise use of our existing infrastructures and systems. Last May, we completed an infrastructural enhancement project at an elevated interchange MRT station called Jurong East Station. Now, this is a major interchange linking the north-south and east-west lines with two platforms and three tracks. Now, to relieve and is serving the east-west line as well as the north-south line. Now, to relieve the wors worsening crowding situation at the station platform and to improve the headway on the north-south line there, we had to carry out modification to the existing station. So the modification involved building new viaducts and platform at the station and converting some of the existing plain line tracks, which were over here, right, into what we call turnout tracks. Now, other than line extensions, this is the first time that such a work has been done in Singapore involving significant infrastructure to the live railway. So this is what you see before the modification. Two platform, three tracks. We have added a new platform. So it's now three platform, four tracks. The new infrastructure was successfully opened in May 2011 and received favourable feedback from commuters as it allowed the north-south line peak headway at Jurong East to be reduced from four minutes to two minutes. We are also currently in the process of extending the overrun section tunnel of the southernmost uh, station's harbour front of the northeast line by about 50 metres, which in turn will, approximately, uh, will improve the headway by approximately 16 seconds. We've identified specially crowded stations on our uh, campus line due to the increasing ridership. So three of our elevated stations will actually be provided with additional entrances which in, t in addition to relieving the bottleneck crunch at the existing entrance, will also serve as additional access for commuters on both sides of the station and provide for a better travelling experience. So for example, this is the elevated station at Clementi. It's right in the centre median. It's currently served by one um, entrance with access on both sides of the road. We are now building a new one. And that is taking place at three stations now. Given that there are still buffers on our existing lines before we actually reach the minimum operating headways, we, are, we will aggressively expand our train fleets. For the Compass Line, we have taken delivery of 22 trains last year, which helped to increase the line capacity by about 15%. From 2014 to 2016, we will procure an additional of up to 28 trains. And as I mentioned earlier, the new Tuas Depot, when fully fitted out, will help to stable all these new trains. In 2015, We'll be taking delivery of additional 18 trains for the Northeast Line, an increase of, uh, representing an increase of about 70% in capacity. And in the same year, Circle Line will see an increase of 16 new trains, an increase of 40% capacity. To address equipment obsolescence and systems availability, as well as enhanced system capacity, we have embarked on the re-signaling of our very first line, the Compass Line. The project will be completed in 2018, and by then it will reduce the minimum operation headway from 120 seconds down to 100 seconds. To improve the system availability and capacity of our LRT systems, we will also be adding 13 cars to the network by 2014, and on the other S uh, SPRRT or Singkong Pungu LRT, we will be doing a system upgrade so as to accommodate two-car operation with additional cars to be purchased as well. 
While our elevated stations have been operating very safely since inception, the significant ridership growth and need to prevent accidental track intrusion, which can lead to severe dis service uh, disruptions, led us to embark on retrofitting 36 of our compass line elevated stations with 1.5 meter height automated platform screen doors in 2009. The last station was uh, retrofit was completed two weeks ago. So with that, all our stations, both over, uh, above ground and underground, are all fitted with platform screen doors. We have also proceeded to install surveillance cameras in our RTS stations and trains to enhance the security of our systems. Okay, apart from serving as deterrent and used by the uh, home front agencies during incidents, the cameras will also help our operators manage the operations, in particular with our driverless systems. To enhance the attractiveness of our RTS, it is important as well to address the diverse needs of our commuting public. In view of the ageing population in Singapore, more than 80% of our RTS stations have been provided with at least two barrier-free, or what we call BFA routes, barrier-free access routes. In addition, we'll be implementing lifts at heavily used pedestrian overhead bridges, which are located near to six MRT stations. So this is an example. We will build lifts, we will have ramp, uh, ramps and escalators, etc., to link to the stations. Going forward, we also aim to improve the first. Sorry. We also aim to improve the first and last mile connection for seamless connectivity. We are now in the midst of developing a walk to ride framework to address the, the needs of connections to heavily to heavy activity points beyond our transport nodes, and we are studying as well how to, this can be implemented in a rational and cost-effective manner. Following the installation of high-height screen doors at our elevated MRT stations. We've been installing fans at these stations by end of this year to improve the comfort of our commuters. Now, with the extension of the RTS network and the increasing number of cross-line interchanges, as well as proliferation of integrated transport hubs, we need very clear, prominent, and friendly signages to help make for a stress-free ride for our commuters. And this is underway. Unlike many other countries, we do not have the privilege of land space for cycling. And I hear just now that there's a big cycling interest in, in the UK. Uh, but we recognise there's also a growing segment of cyclists who wants to cycle in Singapore, some for leisure and others for work. As such, we have proceeded to install adequate bicycle parking facilities at all our RTS stations. And we also encourage our cyclists to use the RTS for longer trips. So, for example, we actually allow foldable bikes for them to bring on, onto the train during off-peak hours. Now, the prolific scale and pace of our programs and initiatives in public transport development in Singapore are unprecedented. However, the journey has been not all smooth sailing, and we expect more difficult challenges ahead. Effective engagement of the community in our projects and programs is becoming even more important. The community and affected interest groups expect to be consulted and involved in various decisions, including alignment, locations of stations, work sequence, etc. Now, to address this need, uh, we have actively set up a community partnership network subgroup in, in the LTA. This was formed in 2008, and we have staff assigned to the different constituencies and attend to the local transport needs of the locality. Although we are an authority ourselves, we are also subjected to the increasingly challenging regulatory requirements imposed by other agencies in the government. The increase in checks and compliance requirements have resulted in longer lead times required both for planning and construction, and has made the implementation much more challenging and exciting, to say the least. So moving ahead, it is evident that tackling our land transport challenges require a holistic solution and out-of-the-box thinking. Our biggest challenge on the RTS system is to deal with the commuter's expectation of being able to board the first train and the inadequate or the perceived inadequate capacity on our systems during the peaks at the morning, lunch and evening rush hours. In particular, the morning peak within peak hours. However, as you can see on the shoulders of the peak hours, there are excess capacities to share the peak loads. So through demand-related measures, we think it is possible to optimise the use of our systems. Currently, one of the operators, SMRT, 
has offered an early travel, um, so-called early travel discount for customers if they leave the destination stations prior to 7.45 a.m. in the morning. LT is also working on a joint incentive scheme. This is called InSync, Incentives for Singapore Commuters. It's a study jointly uh, conducted by the National University of Singapore and Stanford University, and LT is part of it. And this study aims to incentivize peak hour travel, uh, peak hour rail commuters to travel during the shoulder peak periods. The government has also formed a work group to find ways to introduce flexible work arrangements to ease congestion on the public transport system. So going forward, there's still much to be done for land transport in Singapore to be able to keep pace with the rapidly changing environment and policies. A midterm review of our LTMP is now in progress. In the pursuit of enhancing our RTS systems and networks, we also need to find innovative solutions and address long-term sustainability issues. Now, for new lines and systems, we have to review our current approach of implementation and procurement because this may result in desperate, very disparate and different systems and technologies being deployed on different lines. So while our implementation approach may have worked well in the past when we were building up the network, it may not now be the most cost-effective approach as we expand the network, both in the areas of implementation and also operation. Besides of not being able to reap the economies of scale, we also have to contend with the issue of having to build up adequate technical expertise and resource to implement, maintain, and operate the various diverse systems. As our systems age, we need to plan carefully for the renewal, upgrading, and enhancements. Okay, other than the issue of systems and technology selection, the biggest challenge for us is how to be able to implement such works on our heavily loaded operational RTS systems safely, more efficiently, more cost-effectively, and with minimum service disruption, because this is what the commuters expect. Okay, very soon, we'll be embarking on changing out all our timber sleepers on the elevated viaducts of the compass line. So this will be one new challenge that's coming in addition to the resignaling program that's going on. So in closing, I will leave these challenges as food for thought and will welcome any innovative ideas from members of the floor to help us achieve our goal of a people-centred transport system for Singapore. Thank you very much.